Good evening, brothers and sisters. God is good. Amen. He is wonderful to us. And I'd like to uh, open up our Bibles today to Matthew chapter 21. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 21. And I'd like to read two verses, and then we will pray together. But before we do that, I'd like to tell you the title of the message today. The house of prayer shall not be shaken. The house of prayer shall not be shaken. So Matthew chapter 21, verses 12 and 13. Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Let us pray together. Father, I thank you, God, for your great grace that you've given us. God Almighty, thank you for these that are here today that have come to hear your word. But God Almighty, we will never hear it unless the Spirit of God makes it alive to us. God, I pray this moment, this hour of time, have your way in and among us. Move by your word, Lord God. Let there be something beyond us in this place, God. I thank you for this. I pray that you would take me and, Lord, hide me behind the cross, that every eye would see Jesus. I thank you for it, and I give you glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I'd just like to let you know that all hell has come against me the last couple days because the devil doesn't want anybody to hear this. The last thing God wants us to do is to have a heart to seek Him and to pray and find something in God that this world can never provide. And I believe that what I'm sharing today is, although I'm not some type of prophet, I believe that it is a prophetic message. It is a prophetic message, not that I'm predicting something but I'm preaching something about future events and something that may happen within our lifetime, even in the near future. Now, I'd like to open up by sharing a little bit about what prophecy is. Prophecy is not always predicting future events, but it's also foretelling, telling forth things. For instance, Jeremiah spoke, if you don't turn from your ways, God is going to send judgment. And we all know the end of the story. God sent judgment because the people of God didn't turn from their ways. We also know about Jonah, the prophet who was sent to warn the Ninevites, to tell them that God was going to send destruction to them. He didn't tell them if they turned from their ways, but they did turn from their ways. And let me ask you, did destruction come? No, it didn't. All the people repented, and God relented from the destruction. So I'd like to bring this, uh, not, I'd just like to let you know, I've, I've been given liberty, I believe, by God. I, was, I stand up here as one who trembled the last few days as I thought about preaching this, because it's not a light thing for a man of God to come up and to proclaim that something is from God when it is not. So I said, Lord, you have, to, you, have to, you have to clarify this. You have to verify this, and you have to make this real. And you have to give me clarity so I will be able to make sure that whatever I say this evening, I will stand and I will know without a doubt that it is you. And at the end of the, our brother's preaching, your pastor's preaching, I knew in my heart that this is what God wanted me to preach. And I say it with much seriousness. There's, 
It's a very serious time that we live in. We know that this nation and everything that it is about is being shaken to the core because this nation has turned away from God. And many of us are thankful that we're not in Ukraine, right? Amen. But I just let you know, a lot of people came over from Ukraine because they wanted to be in a good place. But I'd just like to let you know, every nation that turns away from God, there is a consequence. And some will say, well, the people of God are here. Amen. God isn't going to send judgment. Well, go ahead and tell that to Jeremiah the prophet. Go ahead and tell that to Daniel the prophet. Go ahead and tell that to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and many other devoted brothers. The judgment still came, didn't it? And we understand that they were in the midst of that, but we understand that God kept them in the midst of that. And we're going to look at it a little bit today. But I open up with the particular passage here because it says that Jesus went into the temple of God and he drove out those who sold in the temple. See, there was something going on in the house of God. And I'd just like to let you know, there are places, I I'm not, may not be speaking about this house of God, but there are houses of God all across this nation that have some things going on them that God is going to start to shake up. Because they're contrary to what God speaks in His Word. God is not going to let things go on in, the name of, in His great and holy name and proclaim that it's His name without some consequences happening. And I'd just like to let you know, there's going to come a shaking. And the Bible says that judgment starts with the house of God. Aren't you thankful for the message that we heard earlier? God is trying to shake some things up because the time is drawing near to the end. And Jesus came into what appeared to be a temple, appeared to be a, a, a place of God. Just imagine the holy people, the priests, the, the, the scribes, the, the people that were there and saw him come in. And they were probably thinking, wow, they're gonna th he's going to think that we got something going on here. You know what I mean? He's going to think that we got some stuff going on here. He's going to see how great our, our worship and our service is. And then all of a sudden, he turned all of the tables over. He shook up their life, didn't he? And all of a sudden, he starts to proclaim something that I believe is the foundation for every person's life. And it ought to be for every church, every body of believers like us, whether you're youth or whether you're old. And it's this, my house shall be called a house of prayer. Not a house of preaching. How many appreciate preaching? Not a house of singing songs, but a house of prayer. The prayer of the people of God is what makes God be manifested. It's what makes the glory of God come. It's what makes the power of God come. You can preach all day long and not have no power, but if you touch God and you're intimate with God, the power is going to come down. There's going to be something of God inside of the preacher if he is a man of prayer. And I'd just like to let you know that there is a day coming when the shaking is going to happen. Jesus is going to start to turn over the tables. He's going to start to shake some things up. He's going to start to send judgment. And only the house of prayer will not be shaken. Only those people who have found their daily time with God and a body of believers, this group of people who come together and pray on a consistent basis. And you might say, well, where is the scriptural backing for this? We all know that the church of Jesus Christ was started in a prayer meeting. There was 120 disciples in an upper room. They were praying. 
And all of a sudden, power came from on high. Now, the period of time by which Jesus ascended up into heaven and they went into the city might have been 24 to 48 hours, but they were praying for that much time. I don't know about you, but if I was left with no power and no ability and Jesus just left me, I'd probably be praying too. You know what I mean? And that's the only thing they could do because they were instructed, go into the city. And did Jesus tell them to pray? No, he didn't. They knew they needed to pray. Because for three and a half years, what did Jesus teach them to do? They taught, they taught, they were taught how to pray. In fact, Jesus came out of a prayer meeting. He came out of a time of prayer and he prayed so powerfully that one of his disciples said, teach me to pray like that. And that's when Jesus said, you know, this is how we pray our Father in heaven. You know, that prayer by itself means nothing unless there's a connection with God. And so it was that the house of God shall be called a house of prayer because the house of God was birthed in a prayer meeting. It was because of intimacy with God. And then all of a sudden this power came and they went out of that upper room with power and they started to proclaim the works of God, did they not? Did they not go out into the streets and all of a sudden people are saying they're drunk, you know? <laughs> There's something weird about these people, but no. They had not been drunk. They had learned languages that they never, learned, never knew. God did something beyond anything. And the Bible says they started to proclaim the mighty works of God. And the word in the original language is megalios. And that means something inside that God works that becomes manifested outwardly. Has anybody ever had that? God does something so powerful inside, the only thing you could do is go out and tell somebody. Amen? My house shall be called a house of prayer. Let's turn over to Jeremiah 29, and I'm going to take us through a history lesson this evening. I don't know how long I'm going to take. I hope not too long. You guys don't mind staying extra tonight? All right. Jeremiah 29. Yeah, he, he made a good point. We started late, so we're going to give some extra time for that, okay? Jeremiah chapter 29. And I'd like to read one verse. And then I would like to jump over to verses 10 through 14. The first verse that I will read is verse number 1. Now, these are the things of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the remainder of the elders who were carried away captive to the priests, the prophets, and to the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. So we, we just verified what I said earlier was true, right? The priests... The elders, Jeremiah sent a letter over to them in Babylon. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and go to verse number 10 now and read to verse number 14. And it says here, For thus says the, the Lord, After seventy years are complete at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you, and cause you to return to this place, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity, and I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you to the place from which I have caused you to be carried away captive. 
what we see here now is a culmination of God's foreknowledge. Foreknowledge means that He knows what happens in what is going to happen long before it ever does. How many of you are thankful for that? Because if it caught God off guard, then we'd be all in trouble. Amen? But God knew that there would be a set amount of years that would have to be accomplished. Now, how many of us in here... I don't know how to say that word in Russian, but it's 2 Chronicles, whatever the name is in Russian. The word Chronicles is some other archaic Russian word from what I understand. How many people know 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse number 14? How many people know that verse? Isn't it a famous verse, you know? So let's turn over there for a minute and find something that we need to look at for just a minute. But one thing we have just laid down here is that God had a plan for the people, but he started to talk about seeking them. But before we go back to that verse, so keep your finger in Jeremiah, we will go to the Second Chronicles. And I'd like to pull something out of here that I would like to share with you for just a minute. Second Chronicles, and I would like to read actually verses 12 through 15. And it says here, Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer, and I have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up to heaven and there is no rain, or I command the locusts to devour the land and send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sins, and I will hear their land. Now my eyes will be open, and my ears attentive to the prayer that is made in that place. Now let's start to get a fuller picture. Because what we start to understand here is that there would be a day. Why would God give these instructions if the house of God and the people of God were never going to get in trouble. But how many of us know we get in trouble sometimes? Amen? And unfortunately, this is a very troubling time that we live in. So God gave the solution for troubling times. And he said, look, I'm going to send judgment when people turn away from me. Isn't that what we just heard about had happened to the people of God in Jeremiah's day? And he sent a letter to the people that God took captive because of disobedience. Because they had left their intimacy with God. How many people were at the camp over there? At the camp, the youth camp? How many people remember Jeremiah chapter 2 where it said, My people have neglected me day without number? You know, that was the beginning when God was saying, look, you've stepped away from me. And now look where you got yourself. You're in captivity. And he says, 70 years are going to have to pass. 70 years are going to have to pass. But he said, look, I gave you some instructions when you're in captivity of what you could do. And what was it? When I send pestilence and I send uh, drought and I send judgment on the land, when I send it there, it says... When I shut up the heavens and I command the locusts and send the pestilence among my people, it didn't say among the world. We all know the world lies in judgment, amen? Every one of them lie in judgment. We just heard about it in Psalm 1 just a little while ago. They, they lie outside of the congregation of the righteous, but we're talking right now about righteous people. We're talking about people that name the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're talking about people that believe the Bible. And here they are. You have to see it because it says, When my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. This word humble is a very amazing word. It's a very amazing word in that oftentimes we think, stop thinking of yourself better than other people. You know, that's pretty prideful when you think that you're better than other people. 
But this word actually means something besides that. It means to bring yourself underneath the control and the authority of another. Through submission to their instructions. So they had left off their first love. They had left off where they needed to be. And now Jeremiah is sending a letter and he's saying, look, look, you're in captivity. You're, you're in the place of captivity. But there was an instruction. There was an instruction manual that was given by God. It was given by God for the time of trouble. When the time of trouble would come or was about ready to come. There was some instructions that God said, if you will humble yourself and pray. Isn't that what it says? The solution is found in prayer. The solution is found in one turning their heart once again towards God and relying on Him day by day, not just saying a prayer on Sunday service. Not just coming and praying with some people, but having a daily commitment with, with God. And when we start to see something here, we start to see what God has given as an equation for revival and power in the land. Because he said, if they will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then I will come. I will bless them. I will hear their land. And my ear will be attentive to the prayer that they make in that place. Going back to Jeremiah, we start to see here, God's saying to them, look, he's saying the same thing again. What is it? Look, you're going to be in captivity because of your disobedience, because I sent some shaking into the land. You know, God always wants to shake things up when things need to be shaken up. You know why? Because those whom the Lord loves... He chastens. So what we start to see here, we start to see it with clarity because God says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Because how many of us when we get in trouble or we're in some danger, we're starting to wonder if God really cares about us. Anybody ever felt like that before? Yeah, sometimes we do, don't we? But God wanted to let them know, look, my thoughts towards you are not evil. I'd just like to let you know when God shakes things up, it's not because he's evil. You'll never find anything evil in God. It's because he loves us. He doesn't want the church to be deceived and to end up just like the world. He wants it to be pure and holy and righteous and upright. He wants it to be a light set on a hill so that all the people in the world could see, wow, that's where God is. Amen? And so he says here, I know the thoughts that I have towards you. And then he says to give you a future and a hope. And then you will call upon me and you will pray to me and I will listen to you. But listen what he says. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. When all of your heart is in it, when you are coming, you know, not other things, but no, all of me is going towards all of God. I will hear from heaven. I will bless. I will give strength. I will give ability. And I will bring you to the place from which I have caused you to be carried away captive. Now let's turn over to Daniel chapter 3. I'm building up on something here. Daniel chapter 9. We remember from Jeremiah 29 verse number 1 that there was a letter sent from Jeremiah to the captives in Babylon. Amen? Isn't that what it said? Now, 
Let's hear what this says. Jeremiah, or excuse me, Daniel chapter 9, verse number 3. Now they're in captivity, right? And I'd just like to let you know they had been there almost 70 years at this point. Just remember that for just a minute. And it says here, Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make request and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. Daniel set his face to seek God. What was the reason that he set his face to seek God? Well, we'll find as we go to, towards the end of this chapter, well, I guess towards the middle of it, starting with verse number 16, let's continue to read. But we know he was praying, he was fasting, and he set his face to seek God. And it says, O Lord, according to all your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because for our sins and for our iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people are a reproach to all those around us. Now, therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplication. For the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. O oh, my people, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds but because of your great mercies. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake. My God, for your city and your people are called by your name. Now while I was speaking, praying and confessing my sin and the sin of the people of Israel, and presenting supplications before the Lord my God for the, ho for the holy mountain of my God. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom had, I had seen in a vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me at the time, about the time of the evening offering. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. At the beginning of your supplication, this command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for the holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. What we are starting to see here is one man's inclination to what it said in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and seek my face, pray and seek my face. The Bible says that Jeremiah in captivity, after almost 70 years was up, that he received the letter. What was the letter? The letter was from Jeremiah, right? And the, in Jeremiah, in the book of Jeremiah, which we read today, it was in the form of a letter that came to Daniel. And as Daniel read it, the Bible says that as he was praying, God gave him revelation about this revel, uh, about this letter, and about the revelation that was attached to it. And what he started to do was he started to hear the instruction. You remember the instructions? The instructions in 29, Jeremiah 29. Then you will pray, then you will seek my face, 
because I have good plans for you. And when you pray and you seek my face, I will hear your prayer. My ear will be inclined to what you are praying. And you will start to hear. And what we need to understand here is God has given away out of every situation that we encounter. He's given us the ability. It isn't through buddying up with somebody. You know, it's great when you're in trouble to ask for some help from a friend, but it's always best to go to God first, amen? And what we start to see in this particular passage is that he started to confess his sin. Come on, this is a prophet of God. This is a righteous man. And he says, oh God, forgive my sins. You know, what was he doing? He was humbling himself before God. He was bringing himself under the authority and admitting, I'm not good, I'm not righteous, but you're righteous. And Lord God, I'm calling on you that you would do a great work and you would establish your holy city once again. And the people would come and worship you once again. They would go back to the house of God. They would have their hearts on fire for you. That was his prayer. He was praying that worship would be established once again. And that once again, the house of prayer would be established. The people would come there. You know, whenever they went to the, the temple, the Bible says that they call that Jewish tradition, I should say. It says that they refer to that as seeking the face of God. Because they went to set their face towards God. The Holy of Holies, where he was. Why do you think it says, hey, that Daniel, when he prayed, he prayed out his window. What was he doing? He was facing Jerusalem. Why? Because that was the place where God was. Aren't you thankful that we don't have to go to Jerusalem? God's right here, right now. The temple veil was torn in two. And God made a way for you and me to have the presence of God right here in human hearts. Communion of the Holy Spirit through prayer and intimacy with God. We will never be void of the Spirit of God as we are intimate with God. As we are walking with Him. We will be unshaken in the days ahead. But I just tell you, there are days coming that are going to shake even the most devout Christians. Even people that lived holy and righteous their lives. But you know what? Some place they've set aside prayer. They may be clean. They may keep themselves from immorality. They may keep themselves from pornography. They may keep themselves from speaking against others. But you know what? They left aside. They left aside the, the prayer closet. They left aside meeting together with the people of God to pray and seek God like they did in the beginning of the church of God. You know, I believe this, that even when judgment comes, there will be a house that stands. And it won't be the, the, the Bible study club. It won't be the preacher's click. It will be the house of prayer. And when all the rest of the world is falling down and falling to the ground, the house of prayer will be standing. The people of God that have been intimate, that have dedicated themselves. I just tell you, I was climbing a mountain the last two days, and the devil would just like me to throw this message out the door. But I said, no, I'm going to seek the face of God, and I'm going to fight through this battle. You know why? Because right now is a very serious time that we live in. It's a very serious time because there is some things that are going to come to shake this world. And I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you that if we humble ourselves and pray before the time comes, before the pestilence, before the trouble, we already know pestilence is all around. But before it, the real shaking comes on to us, before the things that the Bible says men's hearts will fail them for fear of seeing the things that are coming upon the world. You know, if, if we are those people, we're not... I'm, I'm just going to let you know. 
that we can humble ourselves right now and we can seek the face of God and we can say, Lord, I'm renewing my commitment to you and I'm, I'm going to walk with you and I'm going to pray to you and I'm going to seek your face, Lord. I'm not going to let distractions take me away. I'm going to seek your face, Lord, because I want to be a help to the people around me that are going to be falling down, that are going to be in ditches and in dark places. I want to be able to reach my hand out and give some help to them. You know, that's the only way it's going to happen is when we have that intimate time with God. I'd like to turn over to a very obscure book in the Bible. It's the book of Haggai. And I'd like to read a little bit out of this particular book for a little while. Haggai chapter 1, starting with verse number 1. This is right after Zephaniah and just before Zechariah. And I'd like to read a little while. We will go ahead and read to verse number 5. And it says here, In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came to Haggai, the prophet, to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jeho Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people says the time has not come. The time to build the Lord's house shall... Er, the time that the Lord's house shall be built. Then the word of the Lord, Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for the, you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses, and this temple lie in ru ruins? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Consider your ways. These people say the time, how many people are waiting to see God move in a revival and bring people to Jesus? Anybody like that in here? It doesn't happen when you sit around in your paneled houses. It doesn't happen when you sit where you are and you don't say your face to see God, not only as individuals, but as a group. To say, Lord God... We need you to show up. We need your house to be built. But many people sit around and say, I guess the time for revival just hasn't come yet. It'll just happen when it happens. It'll happen when the brothers get together and pray. It'll happen when Eugene and some of the other brothers start to fast. No, it's going to happen when the people come together in unity. Like the 120 in an upper room. It said, Lord, we're not leaving this place till you send power. And these people said, say to the people, hey, isn't it time for the house of the Lord to be built? And what is the house of God? The house of prayer. The only way the house of God is going to be built if it's a house of prayer is by praying. Amen. The only way that it's going to be established is when we set our hearts to say, Lord, I'm not leaving until you bless me like Jacob did. You know, uh, he was there and, and his brother was coming. He thought his brother was going to murder him. And he said, Lord, I'm not leaving you till, till you bless me. He wrestled with God in prayer. And we all know the end. His name was changed because he sought God with all of his heart. But it says here, hey, consider your ways. Because you yourselves dwell in your paneled houses and the temple lies in ruins. You know, I'd just like to make a bold statement here today for us. How many of us would say, hey, this temple is standing? I think we find ourselves in dangerous ground when we think that we stand. Because the Bible says, take heed when you think you stand, lest you fall. That's one of the most dangerous places you could be. 
Lord, it, it would be better to have an attitude, Lord, we're not arrived. We need more of you. We need to walk closer to you. We need your power. We need your strength. Lord, I'm not, I, I may be a little bit better than I was yesterday, but I want to be a little bit better tomorrow. Amen. I want to be a little bit stronger tomorrow. I want to be a little bit closer to you tomorrow. I want to walk a little bit closer and I want to hear your voice a little clearer than I did the day before. I don't want to just sit here and say, oh, God did something to me 12 years ago. It was great. No, I want to say God did something for me today and he's going to do something for me tomorrow. That's what I want to say. I want to say, Lord God, I need you. And as I start to seek him, he is going to do something today. And he is going to do something tomorrow. But when we think to ourselves, no, our temple's great. We got a good service. We got a great service. That's danger zone. Because the shaking's going to come. And I guarantee you, that house is not going to stand. It's not going to stand when the trial comes. It's not going to stand because it wasn't in a place where the people of God were saying, Lord, we need you. And you know, the the remark or I would say the, the characteristics of people that need God are people that pray. If you need God, then you... If you really think that that you need God, then you're going to be somebody that wakes up in the morning, and whether you bow on your knees or you, you lift your hands, however you pray, it doesn't matter. It matters the position of your heart. But you're saying, Lord, I need you today. I'm waking up right now, Lord, because I can't go one step without you. I need you in my life. I just wonder how many people wake up and just go out through their day. You know, that's one of the most dangerous places anybody could be because they think they could do it in their own strength. We can't do it in our own strength. How many of us have found that out before? Oh, praise God. We have some people that have hope in here. Amen. If your hand went up, we all know that we've fallen and failed. If we're not raising our hand, we, I'm no, I don't have no problems. Wait till tomorrow. Because God will bring a problem just to show you who got problems. Because he doesn't want you to end up in destruction like everybody else. Amen? But what we start to see here is, what do you do in sitting in your paneled houses? Uh, he, I'd just like to give you a little bit of revelation right now because we look at this book and we're thinking, man, the God, man of God's just saying this. But you need to understand something. The temple had already started to work. It started to be built. It was in the process of being built. And then some opposition came. And then all the temple work stopped. When God already told them, go into Jerusalem and build the temple. When their enemies came, they were shaken to the core and they stopped doing the work. Eighteen years went by and now the prophecy that Haggai gives, he starts to speak to them after God had provided everything that they needed 18 years before this. Instead, oh, maybe it's not the time to build the house of God. There's some opposition here. Oh, imagine if I would have said that. I would have never came up here to preach this. But no, 18 years, 18 years went by and God's saying, I've had enough of people sitting. You know, look at them. They're building their own houses. They got their own stuff going on. Perhaps they got a nice job and a nice car. And they're, they're saying, wow, look at this, guys. I just, I just got new new." new uh, cupboards in my house and you know look at this this is great and they're building everything up in their own lives but the house of God is laid in ruins how do you build the house of God you build it by prayer so what does God tell them to do look at verse number eight for a minute seven and eight it says thus says the Lord of hosts consider your ways Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. Go up to the mountain. You know, the mountain's not an easy place to go up to. Moses went up there. He was called by God, but did you know he received a pattern that nobody else could receive? Why? Because he decided to go all the way to the top. Did you know the elders... And the, the brother Aaron and his brothers, 
Bad and Abihu, whatever their names are. I can't spit the first one out, but they were called to go up to the mountain too. But you know, they stopped halfway up. Perhaps, oh, it's too hard. No, the Lord's too holy for us. No, there was an invitation. And now Moses, you know, goes up to the mountain. And what does he do? He starts to commune with God. And all of a sudden, he's receiving revelation. And what does he receive? The Bible says in Exodus, read it for yourself later, 25, verse number 15. It said he received a pattern. He came down with a pattern. He came down with a vision. He came down with something to build the place where God would dwell. The tabernacle. And he came back with authority. And the Bible says that his face glowed. And just imagine, he was... He was doing things that nobody else could do. Why? Because, oh, it's going up the mountain, and it's hard, and it's, it's difficult, but I'm going to go up there. And what did the prophet say to the people? Go up to the mountains and bring wood. It, it may not apply to us today, but I'd just like to let you know, when you set your heart to seek God, how many of us know that sometimes it's like climbing a mountain? Everything in hell wants to resist you. And sometimes the only thing we could do is just take it one step at a time. One step and just say, Lord, it's hard to get up this mountain. But Lord, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep seeking your face. Lord, till I get to the top of that mountain. Until I see your glory. Until I grab something from that place. And I go back down. And I bring resources. I bring things that were given to me by God through my own. I like what brother said. I had translation here. But he said, God will do what only he can do. But you got to do something too. you got to get up. you got to go out. you got to do something. God's not going to force you to pray. Aren't you thankful? Man, none of us would love to pray then. But when we set our hearts to pray to God, and we, we set our hearts to seek him, and we just delight in it, isn't it a wonderful thing? I think that some of you in this place know what it's like to be in the place of prayer where it's intimate with God once again. God doesn't force people. He just wants you to get out of your paneled house and He wants you to go up the mountain. And He wants you to grab a hold of resources and grab a hold of what's necessary to build the temple of God on the earth. Hey, hopefully we're not just trying to rebuild what's here. You know what I mean? Because God already made us new. To add to the temple, we need to bring more people in. We need to have a revival in this church. To where people down the street, there's floods of people coming in the house of God because something's happening in here. I appreciate the brother here. Who goes out and evangelizes. I appreciate that there's prayer and stuff. But you know you set your heart to see God and say Lord we're not letting this city go. It's going to hell. Our country's going to hell. Our nation's going to hell. Many of our people they have no hunger for God. They have nothing in their hearts. There's no desire for God. You know the only way that's going to. That's not going to get broken through by talking about it with the brothers. That's going to get broken through by saying, Lord, I'm going to pray and I'm going to fast and I'm going to seek your face and I'm going to be relentless. I'm not going to stop until you do something because you promised in your word that you would provide the resources to build the house of God. My house shall be called a house of prayer. Well, Lord, we want to see prayer happen. We want to see a rebirth in the heart of people for a desire to seek God. Go up to the mountains and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified. That's what God takes pleasure in. When people say, you know what, Lord, I'm giving all the way to this. I'm going to get out of my little house that I'm in and I'm going to set my face to build your house. You better believe God is going to be glorified. He's going to start to do something like you've never seen before. I believe God wants to do something right here in this church with these people. Because he says, I know the thoughts that I have for you. Remember, 
That's what it said in Jeremiah. Plans for good and not for evil. He doesn't have evil plans. He's given you, hey, I got plans. All you got to do is follow him. All you got to do is humble yourself and pray and seek my face and turn from your wicked ways. You got to stop relying on yourself and building your own houses and sitting in your own dwelling places and being satisfied with that. That's not where satisfaction is because one day there's going to be a shaking and those houses are going to come falling down and there's going to be nothing there. So we either humble ourselves now and seek God or be humbled later like these people were. They were humbled later. True? We got a choice to make, don't we? How many of us know what's going on in this world right now? It's a very serious situation that we're in. There's been prophetic words, prophecy about what's going to happen and even to this nation. Considering the times that we live in, what, ought to, what type of people ought we to be? People of prayer. People that say, Lord, build a house right here so when the world comes crashing down, people have a fortress to come running to. Because it's built through prayer. I'd like to share a little bit about that in a real application out of the book of Acts, chapter 4. How much time do I got, brother? Huh? Whenever I finish, I'll hurry. It says here in Acts, chapter 4, let's look at it. And it says here, and how many people know in the very first part of this chapter that they were threatened? Don't you preach in Jesus' name, right? You know, we might get like that in this, this country pretty soon. You know, this, the way things are going. But let's see what it says over here in verse number 23. After they had been threatened, they had been imprisoned, they were let go. And it says here in verse 23, And being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. So when they had heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord God, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. Who by the word, the mouth of your servant, David, said, why do the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your, pur your purpose had determined before to be done. Now look, look on the threats, their threats, and grant to your servants that with all boldness that they may speak your word by stretching forth out your hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. How many of you heard some of the stories from the former Soviet Union? Some of your parents probably were persecuted. Who, whose parents were persecuted over there? Anybody? Probably heard this story. So let me ask you a question. What if some armed militants came in the, the church here with some guns and said, either uh, deny Jesus or get shot? Well, or just say, uh, you can run out of the building or you can just proclaim Jesus and get shot in the head. A lot of those times we don't think of what could happen, right? But most of us might be shaking quite a bit and like, you know, trembling. Some of us would be praying, Lord, keep me and help me, you know. But look at these guys. They were just threatened. If you do anything more in the name of Jesus, something bad's going to happen to you, right? And what did they do? Oh, we better not do this anymore. No, what did they do? They did what the house of God does when it's being shaken. They went to prayer, didn't they? And when they prayed, they said, Lord, you see their threatenings. 
You see what they're saying against us? Now grant us boldness. And the Bible says the place where they were was shaken. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they went back out and they preached the word with boldness. No matter what man said, they could not be stopped. With that said, let's go over to Hebrews very quickly. And with this verse, I will stop. I will end the preaching today. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 25. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not only earth, but also heaven. Now this once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of the things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, then, since we have received a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. There was a shaking, and there will be a shaking from time to time, as there was in the nation of Israel. But did you know that there's going to come a time where God shakes things? Why? So everything that cannot be shaken may remain, and everything that can be shaken will be gone. And perhaps some in this room today are being shaken because you realize You've built your own world. You've neglected your time with God. You're far from where you need to be. You know, Jesus came in to that temple and he started to turn over what the people thought was a good religious life, right? He started to turn over the tables. He started, and then he said, you know what? My house shall be called a house of prayer. You, you think he was just doing that because he was mad? Of course he was a little mad, but he was doing it to wake some people up to say, look, you're not doing it the right way. The right way to do it is to come back to prayer towards God. And then you wouldn't have all this nonsense going on in your life because you would be hearing the voice of God and you would be understanding it. And then when the shaking comes, what do you think is going to be lost? Nothing. Because it says you have received a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Aren't you thankful for that? If you're holding on to the kingdom of God and you're desiring it, that kingdom cannot be shaken. But there will be a day when some shaking happens and perhaps some things are going to fall down. Perhaps it's today for you. But you can say, okay, shake loose whatever needs to be shaken, Lord, so that which cannot be shaken may remain. That's my prayer for me and for you. Lord, shake whatever needs to be shaken because I don't want to hold on to anything, whether, whatever it may be. Maybe it's self-trust, whatever it may be. You put a name to it. It's going to be shaken one day. And the only thing that's going to stand is the house of prayer. The house of prayer cannot be shaken. Let us stand for a minute. This is a time of dedication. This is a time of searching our hearts that we come here to this service. And it's also a time where people can get right with God, where people can turn their hearts once again towards the Lord. Look, the purpose of this message is not to make us say, oh no, if I don't pray, then I'm going to be in trouble. I think that's the wrong reason to pray. There should be a cry in the heart that says, Lord, no, I've neglected you. 
you've loved me and you had a plan for me, but I've neglected that plan. See, that was the, the word to the nation in Jeremiah 29. I had plans for you, good thoughts towards you, but you know what they did? They went after their own plans. But you can say right now, Lord, I want to find your plan. I want to go up to that mountain and I want to receive a pattern, the purpose for my life. And I want to come to that place right now. And if that's you, you can just cry out to God wherever you are. We're not going to call people forward, but you can call out to God right where you are. And perhaps you need to kneel. If you feel like coming forward, you can. That's fine. Feel as you or do as you feel led. But this is a very serious time. And I also speak, I'm not your pastor here, but I also speak as, as one that cares about these sheep that are in this place. I'm just going to say that whomever you may be, whether you leaders or whoever it is, God wants to do great things here. But we have to get back to praying and being dedicated to God. Let us pray. Father, I thank you, God.